All right, real quick before we get into this episode, it's a great interview with friend of the show, Brandon Stukesbury. He's been on the past, talked about short game. He's a short game guru. This time we're talking more specifically about putting and what you can learn there. But before we get into the episode, I want to let you know that we still have our contest going on. We have our master's giveaway going on. You can win five of my favorite golf books, as well as a flag from the 2019 Masters at Augusta National and free access to the Golf Strategy Academy. All of that is going to one lucky winner. All you got to do to sign up is check out the link in the description. It's free to sign up. The other cool thing is when people sign up through your link, you get more entries. So every one person who signs up through you, you get three entries. Pretty slick way to help stack the odds in your favor. But anyway, on to the show. This is Brandon Stukesbury talking about some of the really important things that we probably don't think about enough when it comes to putting. All right, check it out. Hey, what's up, Golf Strategy School? My name is Marty Griffin, and you probably, you might not recognize the face that we have with us because it's been a while. But I am back with friend of the show, Brandon Stukesbury, king of the quotes. That That's one you're going to... Nice, you remembered. I like I'm, that. I'm going to give you the opportunity to think of it right now as I finish your introduction, but I'm going to ask for one in about 10 seconds. Uh, <laughs> Brandon has just, uh, just released his new book, The Putter Book, an owner's manual for your green game. And he is coming to us. He teaches out of Metairie Country Club, which is just outside of New Orleans. And he is here to help us with exactly that, with that green game and how we can kind of maybe reframe our thinking to improve our skills. So Brandon, thank you so much for coming back to the show. And what do you got for us quote wise, not to put you on the spot? (laughs) Well, Marty, I mean, I'm, I'm so appreciative. I thank you so much. And I appreciate that very kind, but gentle jab on how long it took me to get the putter book out. (laughs) Um, Thank you for that. So uh, let's see a good quote. Um, I'll give you one. This was a hall of famer, Jerry Rice uh, Mm -hmm. football player. I will do today what others will not so that tomorrow I can do what others cannot. Um, I find myself giving that statement to lots of uh, budding professional players and college players, uh, you know, high school players trying to make it to the next level. And so um, I like that one a lot. Um, The other one I like a lot that I think I swear every day I'm going to get mounted on my wall in my learning center is actually uh, Yoda who says, um, do or do not, no, there is, there no, is try. no try. Yep. Um, you know, I really <laughs> like that one too, but that's impressive. I like that you remembered that. I love quotes, man. I, I use them every chance I get, um, in my life and in my teaching. And I'm just, I'm a big fan. I have this running list in the notes section of my phone. Every nice. time I hear a cool quote, you know, I write it down, but anyway, thanks for having me back. I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited to have you back. And especially with the putter book here, because I think for, for a lot of people, who are newer to golf, they can understand some of like the mechanical connections with the swing. But when it comes to short game and when it comes to putting, I think there's this assumption that we can just like will it into the hole. When in reality, there's a whole laundry list of, of factors. So why don't you kind of give us, you know, a, a quick rundown about what, the putter book is really about yeah and so it it, i i would have to go all the way back to the wedge book and so and the reason the wedge book sort of came to life is i found myself in a position where i was teaching a topic that there that there wasn't a whole lot of information on in the world um and and when you compare it to the amount of information that's out there and on full swing uh what you see in wedges and in putting pales in comparison um, more so with wedges than putting. There's been a little bit more done on putting than there has been on wedges, but but both of them compared to full swing, to your point, to the golfing public are this big mysterious kind of, they don't know why it happens or how it happens. They just know it happens, right? And, and it looks simple enough. Um, you know, you've got this golf club with no loft on it with a square face and you're supposed to ram it into the back of a ball and make it go where you want it to go. And, and the truth of the matter is it's not any more complicated than that, but, but more perhaps than any other place in the, in the game, 
short game and putting in particular is a very unique blend of science and art. And so what happens is you have a lot of people out there who, who think that people are either just born to be great putters um, and some aren't, uh, you know, that they somehow have this natural innate ability to hit a ball straight or where, you know, that's just not true. Right. I mean, right. The, the putt is a skill that was learned no different. Nobody came out of the womb with a putter in their hand, right. <laughs> and knowing how to hit it and make a ball go where. And so they, they've learned that skill, you know, and, and the other thing that always bothered me about putting instruction and why I wrote this book was this whole idea that you can just do whatever you want when you putt. Like somehow we have this freedom in the world of putting. Well, it's, it's putting. I mean, it's all feel just if it, if it feels right, then you should do it. When I think about that for a second, if I said that to you, if you came to me and you paid me $150 an hour to give you a golf lesson and I ask you what was going on and you said, ah, you know, Brandon, the ball slicing off to the right, you know, and I can't control it. I can't get it airborne. I hit some shanks and I look at you and I go, you know, man, just do whatever you feel right. You know, it's fine. <laughs> you know? But that's what you hear in putting, right? I mean, that, yeah. that's what you hear. And so um, I felt compelled, um, particularly after the success, unexpected, I might add, success of the Wedge Book, that there might be a place in the market for the same type of information on this other mysterious part of golf, um, this other half of short game, if you will, that is putting. Um, and so unfortunately, about two years later than I wanted to, but the putter book was born. Uh, and so, so there you have it. I mentioned earlier, it's written kind of in the same vein and the same style as the wedge book. Um, and I, I described it as a sort of a 15,000 foot view from above of everything that is putting. There's a little bit of everything. There's some understanding of the tool and how putter shapes and how putters work and what moves the implement and how club fitting plays a role and the important skills that are involved. There's some setup information, some green reading information, some practice. There's all kinds of stuff in there. Um, but that's that's sort of it in a very large nutshell, if you will. Yeah, and I <laughs> just all of those things that you're saying – made me think of how many times, and I'm totally guilty of this as well, how many times I've heard someone miss a putt and just go like, ah, I pushed it or pulled it or whatever. It, like, if, if we're looking at that average kind of weekend golfer, when they, when they miss a putt and they just kind of gravitate towards that knee-jerk reaction of pushed it, pulled it, whichever, what percentage of the time do you think they're actually correct? Um, it's a small percentage, and most of the time that is 100% pure luck, but they just happen to claim the right thing or the thing that actually happened. Um, they have no clue. They just don't, they don't understand, right? And, and I go through this whole thing in the book that there are, that there really are three main skills. I talk about there being four, um, but, but, but three main skills when it comes to putting, and you're, you're in no particular order. Your ability to choose the right line, which is green reading your ability to hit it on that line, which is start line control, and your ability to control the speed, right? Um, if you do all three of those things perfectly, putt's gonna go in most of the time, right? Not all the time because we live in an un, un you know, we live in an uneven world, right? You know, bug guts or spike marks or, you know, or whatever. But the thing we do as humans, and this is goes leads back to right what you're talking about, is when one element or a couple of elements are deficient, then the human brain adds to the other elements to try to make up for it, right? So let's hypothetically say that your green reading skills are dysfunctional. So you've underread the putt. Now, you don't know you've underread it, but you've underread it, okay? Well, naturally, if you see the ball continue, you know, it misses low. It misses low. It misses low. It misses low. Before you will ever read more break, you'll hit it harder. Or you'll pull it uphill on the line that you've chosen, right? So you'll mess with either start line control or um, speed control to try to solve the problem of a deficient green read. Well, now the whole system is messed up. Right. And now you have no clue why you missed the putt. Did you pull it offline? Did you underread it? Was it because it hit it, you know, you hit it too hard? Or was it really all three of those things that mixed up together to cause the ball to do something that you didn't expect? And it gets really hairy. 
Um, and so it happens all the time. You hear all these crazy statements and these people making, you know, these these comments. And and I'll tell you the one I love the most. Um, I have more fun with when I'm playing with with my members. Um, <laughs> wow, did you see that? That ball broke uphill. <laughs> no, um, I promise you, Newton's law was not broken on that particular putt. I don't care how much grain was involved or uh, where the ocean is or where the pond or the Las Vegas strip is. Everything breaks toward the strip, Brandon. It breaks toward the strip. Well, I'm pretty sure that's the other way. Anyway, that one's my favorite. It makes me laugh. The ball broke, you know, uphill. But there's all kinds of funny little statements. And you're right. People just don't know. And that's part of why I wrote this book. And so I hope in 105 pages and in a couple of afternoons or two or three evenings of reading at home, you can start to understand maybe why your putt might pull left every time or might push right every time, you know, or why the ball actually breaks the way it breaks. What causes that break? How do I get better at that skill? You know, does my, is does the putter I'm using work for me? Is my setup position me correctly to where I have a chance at making the putter move the right way to hit the ball online? All that stuff's in the book in some fashion. So you bring up, you know, these, these three kind of main tenets of making putts being, you know, choosing the correct line, getting it started on the line that you want. And then the speed, I've always been of the mind that the speed is the most important of those three, but I'm always open to further education and I'm willing to learn. Do you feel that any one of those trumps the others? Uh, no, I don't. And here's why, because it totally depends on the, the, the putt you have and the length of it. Okay. Um, I'll give you a good example. If you're inside five feet, um, speed probably has a little less to do with the equation, um, than it does on a 12 footer. Um, gotcha. You know, if you're 40 feet from the hole, certainly speed and distance by, by speed, I mean, distance control, right? How yep, far you yep. get certainly is more important at that point than start line control, right? Because from 40 feet, you're not really concerned or you shouldn't be concerned about making the putt. Um, you know, I talk to people all the time that really your job is to try to raise your odds of making the putt. I make this joke all the time that statistically, we suck at putting. <laughs> yeah, we do. We're terrible at it, right? I mean, even the best on the planet. I mean, mo most people are shocked to hear that the PGA Tour average make percentage, right? Percentage out of 100 putts they hit from 15 feet that go in is like 26%. Most people are really shocked by that, you know, because they see a highlight reel on TV. You know, I mean, every putt they see on TV goes in just about because that's what you know, TV shows. And so, so here's the best putters on the planet. The best putters walking the planet only make one from four from 15 feet. So statistically we're terrible putters, right? right? And so the best chance you have is just to do whatever you can do to raise your odds of making the putt, right? If you could take 26, or if a tour player could take 26% to 30%, that would be huge. Yeah. Right. And so, um, no, I don't think one is more important than the other because I think one is more important than the other in certain instances. And in other instances, some are more important than the others, if that makes sense. You know, well, yeah, and, that makes total sense. Especially when you, like you said, you're laying out the different links. You know, if, you, if you've got a three footer, it's almost, it, it's all on that start line because the ball probably isn't going to have enough time to truly. That's break. correct. That's correct. So, yep. you know, you're, you're you know, struggling are, with your short ones. Right. There are some outlying situations where you're putting over a lot of slope where you have to play a three footer outside of the hole, but right. most of the time you don't. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and so, so it just, it just depends. I mean, I, I all three are important. No doubt. Yeah. Well, um, and that I, goes, I, that I goes right back to your percentages, you know, like right. let's, let's raise our percentage. If you're looking, and it happens to all of us golfers, if you're looking at your, you know, your memories from the last round, the negative ones are always the ones that jump out. So when you do have that one three footer, 
that did have, you know, that was on the side of a cliff. That's the one you remember because you tapped it and it broke below the hole. And that gets in your head when in right. reality, from a statistical analytical standpoint, if you're truly crunching the numbers, you don't even consider that one ever to have even happened because that's right. it's so incredibly rare. That's right. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's just people just don't understand. They don't understand the math and they don't understand the skills and they don't understand how they all blend in together to actually equal a putt, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, attitude and mental state are important in there. In the book, I add that one as a fourth skill um, because if you, if you have the other three good and you have a bad attitude, it will affect the other three, right? Um, and we all know those instances where we've, where we've been in competition and we've hit a putt or putts with fear mm -hmm. or with hesitation, right? And those suckers never tend to go where we want them to go and they never go at the right speed we need them to go. And we're terrible at putting in that, you know, in that mindset. And so the attitude piece is important. And that's why I call it a fourth skill. I've got this quote that I make in the book that, that um, I should trademark because I don't think anybody else has come up with it. And that's pretty <laughs> rare, right? For me yeah. to come up with a quote as much as I love them. But I, I make this statement that confidence can't be earned. It has to be owned. Ooh, I like that. And, and the point to that is if you're waiting around to make putts, to be confident that you can make putts, you're never going to win. Yep. Right. You have to, you have to have put enough time in with practice and have put enough time in on the golf course to where you believe you're a good putter, whether you are, or whether you aren't, you have to believe that. And I go through this example in the book talking about old clips of Tiger Woods, you know, where, where Tiger, um, and I say this, and I don't mean disrespect by this, but I mean, t t Tiger would almost sometimes kind of sound like a prick in his interviews, right? Oh, yeah. it, because, you know, he would he would miss this putt or he would make this bad shot or he would do whatever and somebody would question it and it would always get blamed on something else, right? That Well, that was a camera click, you know, or mm -hmm. that was a spike mark or that was a, you know, we all knew that wasn't true, right? And it made him sound like he had, you know, kind of an edge. But I mean, if if you really think about it, that's his mindset. There's no way I could have done something wrong. Right. That had to be something else that caused that putt to miss. Right. And that came across bad on the camera, but it's important that you understand that's who he was. That's what his attitude was. That, that if I missed, it wasn't my fault. I mean, there was no way it was my fault. Right. It had to be something else. It had to be some outside agency. And so, um, Attitude's important, and so I, I include it as the fourth skill. But but at the end of the day, the three mechanical skills, if you will, start line control, green reading, and speed control in no particular order. So when we're looking at those three mechanical skills, and like we've already mentioned, people oftentimes, they don't know what's going on. They don't know what's going wrong. If they guess correctly, it's purely that. It's, it's a guess that happened to be correct. How can people go about figuring out which of these uh, skills is kind of letting them down. Yeah. And so in the book, I actually go through a way to test each individual skill. Right. And I'll share one in particular with you. Uh, if I gave you a 10 foot putt. Okay. And it's dead straight. Like I measured it. I'd hit it in front of you. It rolls dead straight with no break. Okay. Okay. And I told you, you had an unlimited amount of time to hit these putts. Take as much time as you wanted. Full routine, not full routine. I don't really care what you do, right? You've got as much time as you need to hit 10 putts. How many can you make out of 10? Okay. A tour player will make about eight or nine. Now, they don't putt to that high percentage in competition because they're not all straight, right? right. So they go in. So, that, so their start line control is very, very good. And you could almost make an argument that the one or two that they miss actually have more to do with outside agency, right? Spike marks or bug guts or, you know, whatever, when, then they actually do their ability to control the start line, right? Your club golfer, the club champion golfer at your facility will make seven, roughly, right? Um, and so if you make any less than that, then I would say 
you need to work on your start line control. You need to get your start line control better. And what's really interesting is when you put people through this test, they don't know why you're doing it, right? If you came right. to me and you, you know you you took a lesson, I'm going to put you on this test, and I'm going to tell you they have no idea what I'm looking at, right? And what I talked about earlier about how people will 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 sort of add some to some skills to shore up deficiencies and others, sure. right? But it's the first one to the right. More often than not. The next one's pulled left, right? And then yeah. it's just go back and forth, right? And that tells me a lot about how they putt. It tells me a lot about their attitude. It tells me a lot about their preparation and their approach and how they mentally move from one putt to the next putt. That tells me a lot, you know? And so that's that's an example of the, t- of, of the, of the, the diagnostic test, if you will, that I use for start line control. I go through a couple of others for distance control and green reading in the book. Um, but, but I test all three when I, when I, someone comes to me for a, a putting lesson and then in testing all three, I also get a reasonable sense of the fourth, which is attitude, right? Gotcha. Because yeah. when they have the right attitude, when they miss one of those putts, they don't do anything different. They right. just hit it. Right. Um, they don't try to make some sort of adjustment because if you make an adjustment, then you likely don't have enough confidence in the stroke that you just made to be right. You think something's wrong with it. So you start making adjustments and changes and you can appreciate how difficult putting now becomes. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. There's a lack of consistency in that approach. Right. And Correct. you know, it's, it's probably arguable that putting is where you need the most consistency out of everything because there are the least amount of variables in a putt compared to full shot, you know, wedge, seven iron driver, you know, you've got just loads and loads of more factors that play into those shots. So yeah, I, when, when you were laying that out, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking someone's pre-shot routine needs to be refined a little bit more. And, you know, let's have that conversation about why, we're, you know, doing our best grandfather clock impression. That's correct. Yep. And so the, the, the diagnostic tests tell me a lot as a teacher um, and I go through them all in the book. And so they're right there, you know, laid out in words and pictures, you know, for everybody to do um, to try to figure out which ones are deficient, you know, and then I, 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 I go on to talk about if, if you find that your start line control is deficient, how do you work on it, right? How do you get it better? How do you improve it? What goes into why it's deficient? Shore that up, and then here's how you practice it. So I, I sort of take people in the book, I take people through each of those, you know, to, to figure out how they can do it on their own. Yeah, and I, I like that idea of having kind of a clean cut process. You know, let's diagnose it. <clears throat> let's figure out why and let's look at our different types of practice routines that we have to amend it. Right. Now, when, when we, when we look at these, these three factors, I know for myself, consistency is, is not like for me right now, I know that my putter is the weakest part of my game. That's what's costing me hands down the most strokes when I really get hot. That's, that's what happened. My putter got hot. It wasn't, right. oh, I'm hitting the shots to five feet. No, I'm still hitting them to 10, 12, 15, or I'm chipping on for, you know, from green side on my par five and I'm making the birdie putt. Right. You know, you talked about that, that mentality. What is, you know, what is something that people can do to help build that confidence? I mean, you said confidence can't be earned. It has to be owned. What, you know, what, what are we, what are we looking at if that tank is at zero? <laughs> you know, here, here's the bad part, right? Um, there is no drill. There is no, and that's kind of the point in the quote, right? You can't yeah. earn confidence, like you have to own it. And I don't think it's any different. I mean, I have two young daughters, right? And my oldest one is just getting to the age of where um, kids are starting to, be kids, right? You know, they'll, they'll be, they'll kind of pick on her, you know, people make fun of other kids, whatever, you know, and so I'm starting to have these conversations about self-belief, 
right? Yeah. And believing that you are a good person and that you are pretty or that you are, you know, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever's coming up at school, you can't practice that, right? There's no drill you can do to make you confident in yourself. You just have to, you have to own it, right? You have to get up in the morning and you have to say, hey, look, I'm good or I'm whatever, or I'm pretty or I'm, you know, nice or, or whatever. Right. Um, it's just like, it's no different in putting. And so, it, you know, I think there's something to be said for diagnosing the problem. There's something to be said for knowing what the problem is and going to work to fix it. Right. And get better at it. But I think at some point you just have to own it. Right. Yeah. I mean, Look, if if I if I were feeling bad about my appearance and felt like I was overweight and I was going to start losing weight, at what point do I look in the mirror and am I happy? Am I now confident in my new appearance? Like that doesn't is it thirty pounds? Is it forty pounds? Is it ten? Like at some point you just have to own it, right? Yeah. At some point you just have to get up and you have to feel better about yourself because you're working hard. Right. You're you're achieving the goals that you set for yourself. And hey, look, I'm I'm better. Right. I'm 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 a good putter. Um, I, I wish I wish I had a better answer to your question, but I don't. Right. I mean, you just again, I think there's something to be said for for actively being involved in trying to get better. Right. I mean, it's a, it's an easier sell for the guy that's working on losing weight to, to feel more confident in his appearance when he's been working out. Right. Yeah. Um, it's easier to have confidence after you walk out of the gym than it is when you just get finished with a half a bag of chips, you know, on the, on the couch. <laughs> uh, so that's part of it, but there is no, there is no Rubicon, right? There is no point in, you know, point in time where you go, okay, that's it. I'm so good at speed control. Now on the, on the eighth putt that goes in, I can be confident that I'm good. Like that just doesn't happen. You just got to own it. And that's, that's the point in the quote, right? Confidence, confidence can't be earned. It has to be owned. You know, at some point you just have to believe it because if you putt with doubt or fear, I don't care how good you are, you will not be good. I mean, you just, you just won't be. And so, you, you know, at some point you've just got to, you've got to own up to it, you know, and you've got to walk out there and say, okay, I believe I can do this. I have confidence in my ability to pick the right line, start it on the right line, and hit it at the right speed. Are they all going to go in? Of course not, right? Statistically, they're not going to go in. But you have to walk out there with that attitude. Yeah, and I think a lot of people, they're they're overly hard on themselves, especially when it comes to putting. Because you look at a 10-footer, and it, it kind of feels like a 6-footer as you're standing over it. And you're right. like, like, I could reach the damn hole. What do you mean I can't right. just roll the ball it's into it? It's supposed to go in, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, everybody's got that happy Gilmore scene in their head. Go to your home. Are you too good for your yeah. home? And so, you know, to and I've I've got plenty of resources on my website. There's resources everywhere for this, but I think it's a really good idea for people to kind of look at some of those PGA tour statistics based on distance and realize that the expectations that they're setting for themselves yes. are oftentimes not only unrealistic for a person of their capabilities, but oftentimes unrealistic for someone whose job it is to do that. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And I think what you're talking about, there's something to be said for that, right? Because if you're playing a par four, let's just say you're a, a, a 15 handicap, right? And so you're the, you know, you're an average golfer that's going out and you're probably going to shoot, you know, 88 on a Saturday. Okay. I mean, you might be a little better. You might be a little worse than that, but if you hit it to 10 feet on a par four, you had a really good golf shot. Yeah. Okay. Really, really good golf shot. Well, now the expectation level just got raised to the roof. Yep. Okay. And so I'm in there at 10 feet. Well, I mean, I, I've got to make birdie here. When the cold hard truth is the best putter on earth would only make about 40% from there on earth right so so what's realistic for that 15 handicap in that situation 30 percent 20 10 percent they, they want right? to get out with the two putt that's what so, they want that's right but just but but to your point right you've done this really great thing and now you have this expectation on yourself that you're supposed to make it no you're really not supposed to make it 
you're not supposed to make it, right? A tour player isn't supposed to make it. Think about that for a second. Yeah. Right? They're not supposed to make it from 10 feet. And so, you know, it, it, it gets hard, and that's where confidence starts to get damaged, right? Um, to your point, that's when it starts to unravel, right? Because mm-hmm. now they missed that putt, even though statistically they should have missed that putt, right? They missed that putt, but something had to be wrong. I hit a terrible putt, right? I, I, had, I must have done something completely wrong, so I need to fix my bad putting on the next 12-footer that I have. And that's where the wheels fall off. Yeah. That's why, especially with like newer, newer golfers, people who are really, really struggling to like break 90. One of the first things I'll tell them is quit trying to make pars like overtly you're not supposed to make try, pars. Exactly. <laughs> try to make bogey and you're accidentally going to make some pars. That's right. That's right. And just, just that little shift can be you yeah. know, a real game changer on the mental side of the coin. No doubt. So kind of keeping it in the, the putting realm, you know, through, through your research, through your experience, what do you find is one of the bigger misconceptions with putting? Whoa. Um, whether it be tied to like one of your three main tenants or whether it's more of like a conceptual thing, yeah, you know, feel I, free to take I, it as deep as you want. I, well, I would probably say we've, we've already talked a little bit about it. I'm not sure if we were recording yet or if it was just you and I, but, but the whole idea that putting is all feel and all art, right? You know, there, there's, there's this attitude out there in the world that, that, you know, you see all different kinds of styles of putting, on tour because that's really where most people get their information right is on yep. is from television and so you see all these different styles of putting you see long putters you see short putters you used to see belly putters you know now you see arm lock putters you see standard grips uh you know double overlap grips you see left hand low you see claw you see reverse claw right you see fat grips you see thin grips you see big heads, small heads, blade shapes. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff. Center mounted shafts. Yeah. (laughs) And, and there's this attitude out there in the world that, that, you know, it really doesn't just, if it feels okay, if you feel good over it and you are confident and you like the putter that's in your hand, it looks good. You'll be a good putter. (laughs) That's just ludicrous, right? I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And so again, I, if I've already talked about it, I can't remember if we were recording, but, but if, if you came to me for a full swing lesson and I said that to you and I asked you to pay me $150 for it, you laugh at me, right? <laughs> that's the attitude that's out there. And so I would, I would tell you the biggest misconception is that, you know, one of two ways to look at it, either you're born a good putter and there's nothing you can do about it if you aren't right. That's obviously false or that you can really just do whatever you want because the tour player does it however they want and they're all, they're all good. So really, you know, if you want to go left hand low, fine, go left hand low. If you like the claw, if you like a fat butter, if you want to stand tall, if you want to bend over, it doesn't really matter. Do whatever you want. That's crazy, right? That's crazy. Uh, And what most people don't know is even on the tour, if you look at the vast majority of them, of course, there are outliers. There are outliers everywhere, right? Yep. But if you look at the vast majority of them, they do four or five things exactly alike, right? Exactly alike. You just don't get to see that because the camera angles aren't always right to be able to show you how those things are working. And so, you know, they, 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 some of them might be bent over a little bit more because they have a shorter putter. Some of them might be stood up more because they have a longer putter, but there are alignment lines that are all in place based on that putter that I go through in the book. They're a lot more similar than they are dissimilar. And so I would say that's probably the biggest myth that I have to overcome as a professional that works at a club, who's trying to get my members and my customers better you know, is, hey, look, you can work on putting. We can identify what's going wrong with your putting and what's deficient and help you get better at that particular skill. Um, you know, I say to people all the time, I mean, a PGA Tour average for three putts per round is 0.5. So they have essentially one three putt every 36 holes on average. If a, if a 15 handicap could get to the point where he or she only oh, had one three putt, one three putt per round one three putt 
I guarantee you their, their handicap would drop by three, maybe four, right? Yeah. Because they have, yeah. they have four or five free putts in a round of golf. And it's just, it's just crazy. It doesn't, it's not necessary. You know, I made a joke to a, a longtime student the other day that, that, that I know very well. And I'm at a sort of, I'm at a stage with them where I can talk to them in this way and kind of rib mm-hmm. them. You know, they went out and they played, it was a, a junior and he went out and he played in a competitive round and he had a four putt. Oof. Been there. And this is a pretty good player, right? I mean, this is a player who's getting some looks from college and she had a four putt. And, and, and I said to her, I, Jamie, I'll make a name up, right? In case she listens and I don't want to embarrass her. But I said, Jamie, I could have kicked it in less than four putts. Like, like you were 25 feet from the hole. You literally could have kicked it with your foot and not putted it four times. Like what, what happened? Right. I mean, that had to be a mental break. Right. I mean, so, you know, um, those things happen all the time. And so I think the biggest myth is that, you know, I'm either born with it or I'm not, there's nothing I can do if I don't have it, you know, or I can do whatever I want. and, And as long as it feels good, well, there are certain things that have to happen for the three skills to add up and we can identify them we can work on them and I can show you how to measure them. Um, and so I, you know, I spend a lot of my time trying to dispel those two myths. Yeah. And I, I know plenty of people who, <clears throat> whether it's putting, driving approach shots, they're, you know, they're of the mind that they should be able to do it the way that they see it on TV, which is obviously absurd uh, or that, I'll just, you know, I'll get a new putter that that'll fix it or a new driver or new irons, whatever the case may be. How do we, you know, more specifically, how do you help guide people, you know, back to reality in that conversation? You know, like there's, there's that like really ingrained belief, like you said, that it's just like, well, you know, all my feet, my touch was off today. My feel was off today it'll be back later. I just, you know, I got right. to will it in more. How do we kind of knock people on the head and say, Hey, that's, you know, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree here. Yeah. This is where we well, in, the, in terms of equipment, right. Or a new grip or a new putter, you know, unfortunately the, the, and I don't know that they do this on purpose, it's just what I have to start to be careful, right? Because I have merchandise partners that I am proud of and that I work hand in hand with, but they spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year telling you that that's going to fix the problem. Oh yeah. Right. And, and it speaks like marketing one oh one, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. what's the pain and let's offer the solution. Right. And so changing to a fat grip speaks to the innate part of us as humans that wants to do it the easy way, right? It's in us all. And it speaks to that. Okay. And I actually talk about this in the book, you know, this idea that is actually way more harmful than it is helpful to feel like every time you have a problem, let's go to putter B, right. Or, or, or the putter I had in college or, or man, I putted really well with that back in 2010 when I won that golf tournament. And so this putter is not really working out. I'm not making a whole lot of putts with it. Let's go back to that putter. Right. Well, well, how about let's figure out why you weren't making putts and let's work on that. How about that? Right. Um, look, it's a constant battle. It's a constant. Look, I wrote a book because it's a constant battle. <laughs> yeah. right? It's a struggle, man. I mean, I mean and, and look, it's no so different than anything else in golf. I mean, we have the same problem with with hitting a driver better. Yeah. You know, I mean, how much. <laughs> This is where I have to be careful again with the manufacturers, right? Because I, I love my partners dearly, but how much more valuable would it have been for you to spend, take that $550 that you spent on the new driver and buy golf lessons with it? Yes. Right now, I'm not saying that a new driver might not be needed, right? I'm not saying that technology improvements don't happen and that those aren't beneficial. That's not what I'm saying at all, right? I'm saying that's not the only answer. Yep. Right. Um, and that's an age old battle that, that golf instructors and golf professionals and, and amateurs have been fighting for as long as the game's been around. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think it will always be that battle. 
uh, you know, and, and the best I can do as a coach is to try to educate people with the content that I put out, whether that be a book or a webinar with my good friend Marty or a YouTube video or a, a, a blog post or, you know, or whatever it is. I mean, I, yeah. I think I think it's some point you come to the realization whether it's the sixth putter that you've broken and thrown in the bushes and bought and it's not working any better <laughs> or if you've you know went from a regular grip to a fat grip and now you're back to a regular grip and you still can't putt well like eventually you gotta figure out why you're not putting well it's the and old it's, it's the old adage of uh you know you're going along you're having your day and you know you run into a person and they're kind of an asshole well, okay. If you're going along and you're having your day and everybody's an asshole, you're probably the asshole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. If it looks like a dog. If it smells like yeah. a dog, it walks Eventually, like a dog. You, know you I mean? are the problem. That's right. That's right. And it doesn't matter what putter you put with, and it doesn't matter how fat the grip is, or it doesn't matter what grip you use to hold it, right? If you have deficient skills, you're not going to make putts. And so until you figure out what creates a better skill, you're going to struggle. Now, now look, don't misunderstand, right? I mean, a bad putter fit can cause dysfunction in the skills. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so it is very possible that, that, that someone could come to me and that the putter fitting could be really the root problem of why they're struggling. And I get them in the right fit. And miraculously, and I put that in air quotes, right? Mm -hmm. Miraculously, all the skills start to line up again. And that happens all the time, right? But make no mistake, that wasn't because we bought a new putter. It was because the putter was ill-fit and was causing dysfunction in the skill. We got yeah. the skill better, and the way we got the skill better was fixing the putter, right? Uh, That's how you have to look at it. I, I don't want to keep you forever, but I do want to touch on this because I think a lot of people, like if you look at golf from the early nineties versus golf now being fitted for clubs is common for people now, but it wasn't really all that common in the early nineties. Like I remember getting fit for my clubs and, you know, hitting off the board and seeing little scratch marks on the heel or toe. And like, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Right. Now there's track man angle of attack, you know, rotation, launch, everything. Like there's more numbers than you could ever dream of. I think for a lot of people though, putter fitting is still kind of a mystery. Could you kind of go into what, what does putter fitting look like for like our average weekend golfer? Yeah. And so, so one of the reasons that putter fitting um, and wedges too, right. They sort of, both of these fit in the same category. Um, there's, there's a couple of reasons why the fitting for those, I think, is behind, right? Um, first and foremost, the knowledge of fitting is also tracking behind. Yeah. Um, we as professionals got way better and way not more knowledgeable at what goes into a proper iron fit or what goes into a proper drive fit driver fit um, than we ever did putter and wedge fitting. Right. And so if you have any doubt about that, go to Google and type in uh, driver fitting and see how many results you get or driver fitting near me. Right. And then type in putter fitting near me. Okay. Um, yeah, that's right. And so, um, our knowledge base as a general in the, the, the golf instruction world um, is way less in putters and wedges than it is in the other parts, right? So that's the first problem. The second problem is due to price, putters and wedges are still a bit of an impulse buy where drivers and irons have priced themselves out of being impulse buys, sure. right? And so at, at $500 for the driver or Twelve to fifteen hundred dollars for the iron. It makes more sense for us to think that there might be some value in the fit, but when the wedge can be picked up for one hundred and fifty nine ninety nine, or the putter. Now, not all putters are right. you know uh, one hundred and one hundred and twenty five dollars, right? But but it still sort of sits in that place where it's an impulse buy. Right. You've got one hundred and fifty dollars worth of gift certificates at the end of the year in your golf shop and they're about to expire. You know, I don't really need another golf shirt. Ah, what the heck? Let's get a putter. 
right? Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I think those two big reasons are why you see putter fitting really falling, you know, behind and wedge fitting falling behind what we see in driver and iron fitting. We as professionals have to do a better job at educating other professionals. And I think the manufacturers play a role in this too, right? I think the manufacturers sure. should take a more active role in educating or helping to educate. And some of them do. I mean, I look, I work with Titleist and, and Titleist for the first time ever put um, a, a Vokey fitting specialist out in the marketplace. That had never happened except for a couple of years ago, right? And this guy's sole job is to travel around and help green grass golf professionals like me fit Vokey wedges better, right? Cool. And so, yeah, and so they're, they're progressive in that way, right? I mean, they, they looked in the marketplace and they said, look, we know we recognize this is a concern and there's something we can do, right? We can put, you know, resources, if you will, behind this. And so I think that's the first step. I think the manufacturers and us, you know, leaders in the industry, I'd like to think I'm a leader in the industry, right? Have a responsibility to help others grow their knowledge, number one, right? And when we do that, then I think we all become advocates in the marketplace for the importance of fitting, just like we did in the, in the late nineties, right? For irons and drivers, right? We, we weren't there. We weren't always there, right? We, we just yep. didn't. And so how did that swing the other way? Well, we started to understand, people in the industry started to understand the benefit better and started promoting that benefit. And therefore the marketplace for it grew and we are where we are. I think the same thing can happen in putting and wedges. It's just behind. And so to me, that that's how it has to happen, you know, but, but all it takes right, is going to a qualified fitter and giving them an hour, whether it's wedges or putter. And if they've done their job, you'll come out of there and understand completely why it was very, very important. I can make a really compelling argument that putter fitting might be more important than iron fitting because the putter's only moving like two feet. Right. So it has a much greater likelihood a, 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 a bad fit or a good fit has a much greater likelihood of affecting the motion in a putter because the motion is so small, right? Yeah. In an iron swing, we have the entire length of the backswing and the entire downswing to sort of use our body to move around and manipulate the golf club and, and sort of fix some issues that might be there. We don't have that in putting, right? But again, I don't think we've done a good enough job at educating our professionals and our professionals haven't done a good enough job at educating the public. And so I think that's how we solve that problem. I, I really like that, that answer or that discussion point on, you know, maybe a putter fitting is more important than an iron fitting because yeah, if you look at the, the range of movement, you have a drastically disproportionate effect on the outcome of the shot with a good or bad putter right. fitting. That's, that's a really interesting way to look at it and kind of. Uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you more. I'm, I'm going to go yeah. one step further with that. Right. I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about the, we're talking about putters, but, but think about it in terms of a wedge too. Right. If, if I fit you into wedges that have a lot of bounce, Right. And I know this is a big topic. We can talk more about it in, in detail later, but let's just assume for a second that you go to the shelf and you buy wedges because you've got that gift certificate, you know, or whatever. And you <laughs> yep. buy a wedge that has a lot of bounce. Okay. A big thick sole with a lot of bounce on it. You effectively just remove your ability to hit half the shots you should be able to hit with that wedge. Yeah. Because that wedge can't move through the ground in a way that hits those other shots. Think about that. Yep. Right. You took half your options off the table just in choosing randomly one golf club. Right. And so again, I could make a really compelling argument that fitting and spin putting and wedges has a way bigger impact right, than it does in full swing. I mean, for example, I mean, I play with stiff steel shafts, right? If you gave me a 
set of regular graphite shafts and irons, <laughs> am I going to miss a few shots? Y yeah, probably. Yeah. Right. But is it going to be demonstrably different in any round of golf? Nah. Probably not. Right. It's not. I mean, it'll cost me a shot or two. Likely the ball will do something that I wouldn't expect it to do, you know, with my irons. But but think about that. Think about choosing the wrong wedge and taking half your available shots off the table. Yeah. That's crazy, right. I mean, that's a big deal. And so we got to do a better job. There's no question. We got We got to we got to do a better job at getting fitting more in the front of the mind of our consumers. So I, you know, like you mentioned, there's, there's a part of that torch that needs to be carried by professionals, by manufacturers, things like that. But there, there's a legitimate part of that responsibility that lies on the player. What are, you know, what are some signs that someone maybe really needs to be fit for their putter if they've never experienced a putter fitting before? Yeah. Well, I, so, so there are two places, right. Of, of the, of the three skills that I talked about, two of them are mechanical, right? Green reading is not a mechanical skill, right. Right? Um, Speed control and start line, okay? Putter fitting can have an impact on both, right? And so I would tell you that if you are an amateur, okay, and you find a qualified, you know, putting instructor or you come see me in Metairie or whatever you're going to do, if I find that either your start line control skill or your speed control skill is deficient, we're going to look at the putter fit, right? Yeah. And we're going to rule that out or in, right, as being a part of the cause of why that skill is dysfunctional. Um, and, you know, if, if, a, if a just – as a good example, right? You know, a lot of people will buy a putter off the shelf and they'll cut the length down, right? You, Guilty. You, yeah, right. You certainly see it a lot in kids where they get dad or mom's old putter, right? And they just cut, you know, cut six or eight inches off the end of it. Well, putter heads are designed to weigh a certain amount so that when they're on the end of a certain length shaft, they provide a certain feel. We call that swing weight in the business, right? And yep. we have scale. Um, if that swing weight gets grossly away from where it was designed to be, then you're going to have problems controlling the speed and the acceleration of the putter head as you hit the stroke, right? And so, you know, if a putter gets more than about an inch, maybe even a half an inch, more than a half an inch cut off or added to it in length, there needs to be some way to adjust the weight of that putter head. Otherwise, you have created a putter fitting problem yeah. that could have an impact on one of the skills, right? And so if one of your mechanical skills are deficient and putting need, you know, the fit absolutely needs to be ruled out or in, right. Um, mm -hmm. as, as part of the problem, it's gotta be one of the things that you look at. Yeah. I, I love that, that philosophy because I'm like, honestly, it's the same strategy I, I use when I'm helping someone try to find their golf ball. Like, Oh, well, I, like I kind of hit it over here. Oh, I see one. I don't think that's mine. Let's drive over to it and figure out for sure whether or not right. it's yours. And then we can keep looking if it's not. But yeah, right. to immediately rule it in or out is, and I think a lot of people, you know, if they've committed to the idea of putter fitting and, you know, potentially getting a new club, they're, they're like leaning and hoping like, oh yeah, that's the problem, right? That's the problem. That's right. gonna, you're just going to give me this new tool and I'm just going to make right. everything. It's never just <laughs> that easy. So yeah, I, I really like you um, kind of bringing up that, that philosophy of going right to that. And like you said, when, you know, it's, it's gotta be the mechanical components that are impacted. It's, it's not the attitude. It's not the green reading ability. Right. It, you know, it's how do we, you know, look at these, these different mechanical things, how are they being impacted by, um, you know, by this, this putter, you know, you mentioned cutting it down. I, 
well, you're a Titleist guy. I've got a, a Scotty Newport two from when I was like 15 years old and I cut it down two inches and I bent it down two degrees. I'm learning now that I probably messed up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So, so to put that into perspective, I mean, you know, it's a, what is it? A Newport? Yep. Newport two. Yeah. Newport two. So the head weight of that Newport two, um, the blank head weight was right at about 335 grams, give or take a gram or two, when he made those putters back then, before he started putting interchangeable weights in the bottom of them, right? Yep. They were built to be used with 35-inch shafts, okay? When you put the 35-inch shaft on a 335 or 340-gram head, and you spec it out on a swing weight scale, it's going to come out pretty close to D2, D5 ish, give or take, right? And that may not make a lot of sense to all the listeners, but that's, we're going to call that pretty normal, right? That's, that's pretty normal. Cutting two inches off of it could have an impact of over 10 swing weight points hmm. to the weight of that head, which is why Cameron eventually started manufacturing putters that have the weight plugs, right? That makes sense, yeah. So, so now he makes his putter blanks lighter so that when you order a 35, you get X amount of weight put in them, which adds up to 340 grams. If you order a 34-inch putter, you have Y weights that go in them, which adds up to 350 grams, and if you order 33, you have Z weights that go in them, which add up to 360 grams. And the point is, I can hand you all three of those putters with a blindfold on, and they would all three feel the same. Yep. Despite being up to two inches shorter or longer, right? And so modern day technology and modern day manufacturing has allowed him to begin to do that and offer the ability for the putter fit to be manipulated based on what you need as a player and it all be right. You know, back in the day, I would have had to have add, added a ton of lead tape to your putter, mm -hmm. right? It probably couldn't have added enough lead tape, frankly, right. um, you know, to make up for two inches, but that's how we would have solved that problem 20 years ago or 25 years ago. Um, and so putter fitting has come a long way. It still hadn't come long enough or far enough. Um, but, but yeah, you, you need to, I mean, look, I'll say this and I broke my own rule here. Right. And so my <laughs> first question to you would be, do you have a speed control problem? Yeah. Then you need to look at your putter fit. Yep. Right. Because it could be, it could be that you get a heavier head on the putter. Right. Or find a way to add weight to the head or however you want to get it. Um, and you might be surprised at how quickly your speed control improved. Right. And I'll give you the ultimate example of that. I want you to imagine grabbing your putter and swinging it a few times with, you know, just at the air with, with the head down there and then pick it up and flip it over and hold the head and swing the grip end of the shaft down by the ground. Oh my Lord. <laughs> but that's effectively what you've yeah. done. Yep. Right. Because it's way lighter than it should be. And you can appreciate the impact that has on your ability to control acceleration and speed. Yeah. I mean, it, like we've mentioned the, um, the visual of a grandfather clock, you know, what happens if you shorten that arm by two inches? Right. It, it's not ticking the same way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, you know, that, that's an example of how I would, how I would do that. Right. What skills are dysfunctional? Oh, I have really have a speed control problem. Okay. Let's test your speed control. Sure enough, you do have a speed control problem. Okay. Well, why do we have a speed control problem? Putter fitting is going to be one of the things I look at. It may be that the putter fit is fine and you have a speed control problem for other reasons. Right. But if I find somebody who's got a speed control problem, and I check their putter fit and it's two inches short for the head weight that's designed, right, to be played at 35. The first thing I'm doing is I'm going to have a conversation about getting you in 
a properly fitted golf club. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that we just add weight to the 33 inches. It means that we're going to make sure that you need 33 inches. Maybe you really need 35 inches and we can just add two inches back to the shaft and you don't have to touch the head. And it, it specs out exactly the way Cameron made it when it left his factory. But the putter fit has got to be something we look at. Yep. Yep. I, I totally, I totally agree. I see where you're coming from. And I think when you get into those situations, it's as a player, it's really important to kind of keep an open mind as to all of the possible causes of these mechanical issues, because it might be something equipment related. And I think a lot of people when they, especially if they're new to fittings in particular, they just think that they're, they're being sold something. Right. You know, like, Oh, that's just, you know, he, he needs another boat or whatever the case may be. That's like what I tell my dentist when he says I need a crown, I'm like, yeah, I'm not paying for your boat. Uh, but I, you know, I think there's kind of that misconception for a lot of people out there that like, you know, they're like, they're, they're just like car salesmen. They're trying to get more equipment in my hands. Well, if that's the problem, right. of course, we're going to suggest right. that's changing right. the equipment. I mean, you know, if, if you have a flat tire, do you take it, you know, when AAA comes and, and they're going to change it for you, if you're not changing it yourself, are you going to look at them and say, well, that's just because you're tire people. That's no. right. The tire is flat. That's what you got to fix. I mean, well, got to be honest. I, I go, I go right back to the education, right? Because the education solves that. And what I mean by that, in your example, when your tire's flat, you know, your tire's flat. True. True. Like you're educated enough to understand that that's a problem. So when the yeah. man comes and says, Hey, that won't work. You can't drive like that. You go, yeah, you're right. Okay. How much yeah. is it going to cost me? But, but, but our consumers and frankly, a lot of our professionals aren't educated when it comes to putter fitting. And so when I have this conversation with them about it being two inches short and it, the head weight's a little too light, it looks and feels so abstract, right? Because we're not educated or they're not educated on what I'm talking about. Then it really does feel like I'm trying to, you know, buy another boat. And for the record, I don't know a whole lot of golf professionals. <laughs> that own boats, right. I can't speak exactly. For but, 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 you know, um, I'm, trust me when I tell you, I'm not trying to buy another boat. If, um, I, if you're a I'm golfer not. and it's nice enough to boat, it's nice enough to golf. That's what That's you do right. instead. That's, right. That's, right. That's why yeah. people always ask me like, Oh, do you fish? No, I'm a golfer. If it's nice enough to fish. It's nice enough to play golf. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the, and that, that speaks to a larger problem. Look, I, I wish there was some way in our world um, that we could guarantee expertise. Oh, right. That would be amazing. Um, and, and it's not just in golf instruction. It's across, you know, there, there are questionable doctors and dentists and accountants and, and, you know, look, not everybody is as good as other people. Right. Sure, and, and yeah. so, you know, unfortunately, sometimes you invest time and resources and energy into going and getting professional help to figure out why you're putting poorly and you don't always get the best help, you know, right. um, that's unfortunate. Right. Um, and I guess to use your example, you know, sometimes maybe people are just trying to buy another boat. Right. Um, that sucks. Like, I wish that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, I wish that wasn't a thing, you know, but it is. And that's why you as a consumer have to be educated right? You have to be a little bit educated because if you really didn't know that the flat tire wasn't normal, then you would think the same thing about the triple A guy. Yeah. That, that sounds ludicrous, right? But I mean, if you really didn't know that it's not normal for the rim to be sitting on the asphalt, right? <laughs> it, then, then you would question him as well. And so I, you know, I think you have to have some education and I think, to your point, it's every golfer's or should be every golfer's responsibility to be a little bit educated, right? So that they can make some informed decisions when they go to try to find a coach or an instructor to help them. Um, and, and I think if you can go to that, that introductory meeting or the first time you meet with that coach with a little bit of information, then I think you're much better equipped cut through the boat builders, right? <laughs> um, and make sure you get somebody that's really, really good. And if you do, then that could be a match made in heaven. 
Absolutely. Well, Brandon, I don't want to keep you forever. You've shared a ton of really, really awesome information. I think people can get a lot from this episode. And, you know, like you mentioned, if, if this makes sense to you, it's all there and then some in the putter book. So, uh, Brandon, where can people learn more about you and where can they find the book? Yeah, so the book is sold on Amazon um, almost exclusively. So if you just went to Amazon and typed, you know, typed in the putter book, um, you're going to find it. It's a, a black background with a giant zoomed in image of a putter. It's pretty hard to miss. Um, the wedge book, um, if you haven't gotten that one already, is is the same way. Um, now that I've sold a few, um, it tends to bring up, you know, customers have also bought this or this author also has this book. Um, but everything's pretty much sold on Amazon. If somebody really wants a, um, an autographed copy, I can do that and I can send it to you directly. You just contact me through my website. Everything I have in the world, um, is pretty much under Stooksbury Golf. So the YouTube channel, Twitter handle, Instagram handle, Facebook. Uh, web page, everything is Stooksbury Golf, my last name, Golf. Um, if you just type that into the old Google, then you could find out how to get a hold of me. But but if you have questions or you want to sign copy, just go to my website, find a contact form. I manage that website personally. I see all those contacts that come in, um, you know, and I'm, I'm happy to, to kind of help you, you know, any way I can. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being on the show and thank you for sharing your expertise on the short game. All right, listen, I'm going to leave you with a quote. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Here we go. You know, I've got to, right? All right. So I grew up in Tennessee, all right? Um, not too far from Oak Ridge, um, where most people may not know, but that's where the first atomic bomb was built. There was a nuclear physicist that worked for the University of Tennessee, Go Vols, my alma mater, named Willard T. William T. Pollard. And his quote goes like this, learning and innovation go hand in hand. The arrogance of success is in believing that what you did yesterday will be sufficient for tomorrow. And so I feel like that goes along pretty well with, with consumers being educated and our responsibility as leaders in the industry to try to educate consumers um, on how to get better and the importance of putting and short game and, and, and fitting and all that goes along with it. So there's my last thing quote. Um, I appreciate you remembering that I like quotes. Awesome. Awesome. Awesome.